Opinions expressed on this radio program do not necessarily reflect the views of this radio station. My friends and I always tune into the Todd Levitt Law Show. Todd is entertaining, informative, and always delivers the goods. Todd might not tell you what you want to hear, but he's going to tell you what you need to hear. And all you got to do is listen. Hold on, Todd. Don't let go. It's time for the Todd L. Levitt Law Show. Welcome to the Todd L. Levitt Marijuana Law Podcast. Good morning, good evening, and good night. I'm yours truly, Attorney Todd L. Levitt, broadcasting and podcasting from the executive order put in place by our governor here in the state of Michigan to stay away and stay home. So I'm with uh, myself and uh, the familia here in my own mothership located somewhere in the middle of the mitten still a beautiful green nutrient field the weather is warm the sky is blue craig russell you know it's coming we love you how you doing craig are you in quarantine or has your governor ordered you to stay home well yeah my governor's ordered me to stay home like like your governor's ordered you to stay home so we are actually broadcasting each one of us last week i was in the studio and you were at home this week we are both at our houses uh, so we are doing this. Uh, we're trying to keep everybody safe, trying to keep everybody from spreading it. I saw the best meme earlier this week. Don't think you are distancing yourself from people because you don't want to catch the coronavirus. Think you already have it and you're distancing yourself from people so you don't spread it. Simple as that. Great point. And so two, three days into the executive order in the state of Michigan, which is what now more than a dozen states ordered to stay home. Right. I, I've gone out almost every day uh, biking um, to certain trails and out and about to the gas station. There's still people everywhere. I mean, yes, people are staying home, but people are looking at each other like they're almost like zombies. If you go to a gas station, I don't want to be next to anybody. I'm, I guess I'm one of those individuals. I just look at everybody the opposite of what you just said, that they may be a carrier and I don't want to get near that person because are they taking the same protective measures I am? I'm wearing gloves. I have a face mask. Uh, I happen to have uh, I happen to have had uh, one face mask, one of those uh, uh, N95 masks. I'm not sure if that's the right one by 3M. OK, but people are looking at each other in, in a way as if everyone else is carrying it. Well, here's I was in a gas station and I walked in to pay for gas and uh, as I was walking in, the lady was spraying Lysol in front of the door and everything. And she said, can't be too careful. Somebody was just coughing in here. And I'm like, OK, I get it. It just seems a little maybe maybe some of this seems a little I don't know what it well, I don't know. I don't know if it's I, it certainly can't feel much more like an invasion of privacy than it already has become. And we certainly do not feel like we're Americans anymore because we've given up a lot of our temporary rights and freedoms because of this but it just seemed a little a little uh, i don't want to say racial profiling or anything like that but somebody walks in and coughs and so thus you're immediately going to spray stuff behind them because you think they're going to spread something what if they just had a cough 
I don't know. Maybe I'm taking it too literal or too serious, but it just seems like maybe we're a little overkill on some of these things. If I walk into an establishment, which I'm not doing at this time, someone's coughing, I'm ducking. I'm getting the heck out of there. So, Craig, you're more than welcome to take on the cough. I'm getting the heck out of there. So that's all I have to say about that. And here's the other thing. Again, we can't say this enough. You know, so many of our listeners, so many people around the world, or this, this podcast is downloaded in 40 plus countries. This is felt everywhere. There's so yeah. many small, medium and large business owners, employees. And, you know, thank goodness the government passed that stimulus. There's relief in sight, you know, for uh, businesses of all sizes, I'm hoping, especially the individuals who make a certain amount of money. They'll receive a paycheck or two from the government. I, I'm just really you know, happy for those individuals, but there's so many people suffering out there, Craig, there truly is. And uh, it's really, and to all the people who are sick and their families and who have passed away, it's just tragic, but we will come through this. We will be okay. Yeah, we will. We're a strong people. We're a strong country. The world is strong because yeah, this is affecting more than just us. I mean, there are countries that download this podcast every week that are going through way more serious stuff than we're going through here. Yeah, you can still go out and bike and you're still seeing people out even though the executive order and blah, blah, blah. There's other countries where they've got guys with guns and they're keeping you in your house. And there is no, they don't care. Personal liberties be damned. They are, you're staying inside until this thing passes. I would hate to be in Italy or Spain right now. There have been people I know who are uh, uh, planning trips to that part of the world. I would just avoid that like the plague. And here is the plague. Uh, It is just a rough thing. The one thing about that stimulus, and I don't know if they've talked much about it, uh, but the money that we're all supposed to be getting, you know, the personal money that we're supposed to be getting, it's not going to be for a while. They say at least May, because it takes the IRS a long time to get uh, checks ready to go and to figure out who needs all the money and how they get it. I mean, this isn't just something they can just flip a switch and everybody starts getting checks mailed out tomorrow. It takes a lot longer than anybody realizes. Plus, the IRS is really short-staffed these days, not only because of the virus, but because they've had their budget cut like three times since the last time we got one of these stimuluses. Do you remember what your last stimulus was, Todd? Do you remember it? I, I'm, this is a family show, so I'm not at liberty to talk about what my last <laughs> stimulus was, Craig Russell, but maybe you could talk about what yours was. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Thank you for coming. Todd Levin, everybody. And, uh, that's all I got. Thank you. Yeah, he's here all week. Try the veal. No, but uh, Craig, here, here's something, though. I do not recall the last stimulus. Here is something, though, that I'm really proud of. What's that? I have a number of clients who work for, especially my cousin, uh, nothing but respect for AZ, um, you know, at the front lines of the automotive industry. I'm so proud of the state of Michigan and our workforce. I have clients, each of them work at one of the three, well, aside from my cousin, but they work at General Motors, Ford, and Chrysler. I spoke to a client who works for General Motors at the tech center in Warren, and for about a week now, if not longer, they are cranking up and making ventilators. Yep. Also in Indiana, yep. my cousin had mentioned to me, the GM plant in Indiana is making ventilators. They're making those plastic face masks. So the state of Michigan, our amazing workforce has stepped it up, um, and they're definitely uh, you know making the, the, the things that are necessary for the frontline workers and for men and women for their lives to be saved. So well, that, that's a good that's a good thing. It's a good thing. And not only that, but it also will help our economy, albeit it's fragile at this point, because that keeps people still working. If uh, they just cut, they just shut the, the auto plants down, there'd be so many people out of work. At least this is going to keep some of them uh, essential duties still working and making things and helping out the effort. I mean, this truly feels like, you know, 9-11 is our benchmark. You know, that's our Kennedy assassination for you and me. 9-11. We remember, we all remember where we were when 9-11 happened. I was not around for World War II. I know you were, but I was not around for World War II. Uh, but this feels like World <laughs> <laughs> You like that? That was funny. This feels like our World Good War one. II right here. You remember when everybody had to ration stuff? You could only get you know two pounds of meat a week, and, and all these people went to work in the factories to build bombers and build stuff. Granted, this is a little different, but this feels like this is our version of that. And at least it feels good that yeah, we're doing it's definitely, something. It's definitely... It's definitely a weird, odd time. It is. And um, as I, you know, I live out in the sticks. I live out, I don't know where there's not many homes or people around. So I'm sort of used to being somewhat secluded, which I love. And when I, you know, across northern Michigan, some of these single tracks and the dirt roads and gravel that we train on, again, you may see a cow or a horse. But, you know, the other thing I found interesting, and this has been all over the news as well, all of the individuals who live in the big cities 
who have flocked to the cabins and to the country and to, you know, resort towns to get away from the city. Yeah. And uh, I've seen I've seen a little bit of that as well. But when I'm out on the single tracks, I don't see anybody. And that's a good thing. I can go for hours and hours and miles and miles and maybe see a deer or, you know, a chipmunk if they're out that time of year. But, uh, hey, Craig, the good news is we have a huge show for everyone in there that's listening to the show on Sunday morning or the podcast version. Judd, who is the head grower for the M66 group, uh, is coming on the show to talk about everything. We're going to talk about home growing this show. We're going to talk about and we promise the listeners, some of them have reached out to us asking for it. And we're going to deliver big time. Well, it's it's perfect because a lot of people are stuck at home right now. So why not take advantage of the fact you have to be in your house and be in your property for extended periods of time? Why don't you put that time to some good use, especially considering how busy a lot of the uh, dispensaries and the marijuana shops in the state are these days because they're an essential business. Why not take advantage of that situation and, you know, and maybe also help out your neighbors, too? Yes, we will have Judd on in uh, just a minute. Let's take a break on the Todd L. Law Show. We will be right back. Welcome back to the Todd L. Levitt Law Show, broadcasting and podcasting at home due to the executive order, keeping a safe distance from all the other citizens who inhabit planet Earth. And in his mothership is Craig Russell. And Craig, joining us for the first time, is Judd from M66 hey Group. Hey, Judd. Thanks for having me, Todd. Hey, Judd. How you doing, buddy? We've been teasing the audience for a couple of weeks that we were going to have somebody on or we were going to do a show about growing cannabis at home. So a couple things. You you are a head grower for a Michigan corporation. And how many years have you been growing? Uh, I've actually been growing in Michigan for 10 years, since 2009. Let's start from a lay person's point of, point of view here, assuming nobody knows anything about cannabis, a.k.a. marijuana, and how to, how to start a home grow, a legal home grow. Again, disclaimer, we're not asking or nor are we advising or giving direction to anyone anywhere that lives in a state or a country where it is illegal to do certain things, including growing cannabis. We are in a state uh, that is recreational, so you can grow uh, per resident, 12 plants per household. There are some exceptions, but let's just stick to the 12 plants per household. Under the Medical Marijuana Act, uh, it could uh, it could go as high as 72 if you're a caregiver uh, and you have five patients, including yourself. So, Judd, um, if somebody's interested in growing 12 plants, where do they start? What do they do? I would say you have to designate an area. You have to find a place that's going to work for you, that's going to be out of the way. Um, that you don't mind a little bit of smell barrier, depending on how much money. I would designate a budget because it's going to cost some money. You can do a lot of things on the cheap. <clears throat> but if you want the product to come out right, you have to put in some capital. Um, so well, let's start off with place, a designated area. Yeah. Well, let's, let's back up. Let's take it one step at a time. It's designated area. So if you live in a house or you have farmland and you have a structure, um, so you're, if you have a house, first you have to talk to the spouse. 
if you live alone no. or you have a roommate. And again, if you're a tenant, there's also other legal considerations. So let's just say you have a basement and a big basement. So you're going to create a growing atmosphere. Is that the first thing you want to do is build a grow room? Uh, well, no, you don't actually have to go that far. Um, you plants are very much like humans. You got to find a place where you're going to be comfortable, where the temperature is going to be comfortable, where the humidity is going to be comfortable, where the lighting is going to be comfortable. And then you got to, you got to mark it off. You don't necessarily even need to build anything. You can just take some plastic, dark plastic, keep the light out and just go around a pole in your basement, for example, and make an L and then go to the wall, put some cinder blocks down get some staples or nails and get it into the, the rasters in the basement. You just made yourself a room for under 20 bucks. Well, now um, the plants have, are happy in there but as if long you, as you get some airflow. But Judd, so let's add, let me ask you a question. So you say you want it to be a dark area. You don't want any light. Do these do plants not need the light, or do they need a special kind of light? Yeah, I was going to say you want a special light. The, the plants in their flowering state, they need only a certain amount of light, 12 hours, in fact. So if they get more light than that, they could change sex, hermaphrodite, uh, pollinate a whole garden and turn it into seeds. So they have to have a dark room to com- to make their flowers for 12 hours of the day. Okay, let me, let's me let just back up again. I keep backing this up. <laughs> let's take it from a lay, a lay person's point of view. If you could have the perfect situation in the resident in which you reside to start growing 12 plants, what would it be? Would you do the plastic around a pole? Would you build a grow room? Let's say you had unlimited funds, Judd. How do you go about it? What would you prefer? Unlimited funds? I thought we're trying to give people who need a stimulus uh, a hobby without any uh, <laughs> invested finances. He knows. But, uh, sure, that's fine. I'll take unlimited funds. I mean, you really just need some two-by-fours. You need to frame out some nice size room. Um, have one for the vegetative state of the plant. That can be about a third of the size of the flowering room, um, have a flowering room that you hang six lights in. Let's say you have a 10 by 10 room. Um, and then you would have, a how do you, on, all right. So yeah. again, let's back it up again, Judd, hold on. <laughs> You're going to build a room. What needs yeah. to go in that room to begin to grow operation? You're going to go to a grow store. You're going to order online. Let's take yeah. it from the very beginning. You have a room. Now what needs to go in the room to okay. take care of these babies and where do you get them how do you start all right all and right. where do you get the seeds um you go online and order seeds um i know there's different international laws that affect different countries uh, as to where you can order seeds from but basically a simple google search can find you vast amount of seeds that can be ordered for under a hundred dollars for sure the seeds arrive and let's say you're not going to order online because you live in a state or it's not legal yet or you live in a country where you can't purchase those type of products uh across the commerce so how about you have an individual who is in a state where it is legal to grow and at, whether it's medical or rec and they're going to provide you with seeds can you do it that way sure even better they could also provide you with cuttings which would be snips off of their plant in vegetative state. And then you could take those cuttings and, and cause them to start roots. And then you're guaranteed to have the sex of the plant it was cut from, which is pretty beneficial. Okay, so cannabis is a plant that has two sexes, male and female. You want to make sure you grow the males because the males will give everybody seeds. So please <laughs> grow all the males you can. <laughs> okay, good advice. Now, all right, so you got the grow room. Somebody gave you some seeds. And you're either off to the store, a grow store online, or someone's given you, you know, the ability to start your grow process. Are you growing in water or are you growing in soil? What do you prefer, Judd, as a head grower? Uh, well, I prefer ProMix HP, and that is not a plug. That's just the best stuff out there. Um, what is that? That is, a, that is a mixture. It's actually technically still called hydroponics. Because the way I understand it, hydroponics means the plant is getting its nutrients from the water and not from the soil, not from the media that it's in. So anything is hydroponics unless it's specifically getting the nutrients from the soil itself, like putting bat guano in the soil or earthworm castings. We're literally feeding the soil with things that the plant is going to eat. Fish oils, uh, fish scales, bone meal ground up. 
Um, even dirty diapers, I've heard plants love. Um, you know, if, if they're taking the actual nutrients they're getting from the soil itself, then, um, then you're going to have some tasty pot. But you could also rot your roots pretty quickly. So, so you're um, taking a seed, you're taking a seed, correct, and you're putting it into, you know, for those out there that have never grown marijuana plants or seeded a marijuana plant, are you taking an individual seed and you're doing what with it into that mixture? Well, it, you should take the seed and you should put it in some paper towel in a Ziploc bag, wet the paper towel a little bit, moist, not too moist. And you want to leave it above your fridge or somewhere warm for two or three days. You're going to open it up. You're probably going to see that it sprouted a little root stem thing. And then you could go into your mixture at that point. And then so educate the audience on what's the next step. So you take it from the towel, the paper towel, into the mixture. And what is the mixture uh, contained in? Is it contained in a cup, a container? Uh, a bowl. I mean, again, I know all this stuff. Yeah, I'm just trying uh, to sure. ask you in lay terms. So, what? Yeah, take so us through that process. In, in, a, in a dirt, then you would have a pot. The pot should have some holes in the bottom so the water can drain out. Um, I would buy some nutrients too. So, when the nice things you put in the soil get eaten up, you've got more food to feed the plant. Um, and how often are you attending to these plants on a daily basis? You could really leave them for two or three days and come back if you give them enough water to sustain themselves. Um, but they love well, what love. kind of lighting are you what what type of lighting are you utilizing? Uh, well, there's two two phases of the plant's growth, vegetative and flower. So they need completely different light to simulate the sun that they would be getting in those times of the year. So the vegetative state, you want sixty five hundred Kelvin, uh, kind of a blue light, and you want to like mimic a bright noonday sun. Um, you can give the plants that light twenty four hours a day. Some people say to put it on a uh, eight hours off and 16 hours on. I don't agree with that. I say the more plant, the more light, the more photosynthesis of the vegetative state. Um, for that, I like to provide fluorescent bulbs. The T5 is a fluorescent tube that you can buy in the grow shop. Pretty easy. You can plug it into the regular wall usually. You can hang it pretty easily. Um, plants love it. They also grow a lot of nodes or, or faces that are going to turn into buds. On the T5s, make sure you get the 6500K, the blue ones, for vegetative. Um, then I would move for a small home grow to a 600 HPS, which can be bought the whole package of the hood, the bulb, and the reflector, probably for around 120 bucks online. Uh, and throw that in a small closet, 4x4, four four, make sure you get a lot of good airflow. Use the vegetative light in the beginning and switch it to the flower light when you're ready. Yeah, make sure you get a timer for the for the for the flip. You're gonna flip the plants from their vegetative growth state to their flowering growth. For the listeners out there, how long does it take for the plant to go from the vegetative state to the flower state, and what does that look like for the amateur who's just starting off? Um, well, if we're starting at the seed, it's gonna probably take a good two months for the seed from when the seed cracks to when you have enough branches on the tree that it's worth starting the flowering state. Um, starting from seed is, is, is way back in the process. If you can get a cutting from a friend who has a quality plant and you can turn those, you know, have those root by putting it in something called an easy cloner, which can make it root in about a week or two that would have, you know, an aeroponic spray on the bottom, which is just a pump with a manifold and some sprayers spritzing the bottom of the, the nub where you cut it off from the main plant. Do that and have the water temperature somewhere between 70 and 75, even without any sort of products, and you'll have roots in a week or two. And then you can go from there to a lot of different media. You can put it into the dirt. Make sure you give it a lot of water at that point. Um, and then you have a plant. So what's the, what's the difference between hydro versus dirt? And what do you prefer as a, lead, as a head grower, hydro versus dirt? Every, everything has its own advantages. Hydro can grow a higher yield, can have a cleaner product. Dirt, I feel, is much better for the home grower, much less maintenance. You can just throw the dirt in your backyard when you're done with it. It has dirt usually comes with buffers, a.k.a. lime, dolomite lime, that create a pH environment, pH meaning acid versus base. So the buffers help make the pH right for the plant. A hydro grower has to pretty much have a pH tester on hand and has to test the reservoir and the water that's going into the plant to make sure the pH is right and the nutrient levels are right. 
Um, if you're the type of guy that likes to do that or girl that likes to do that and test things and be on top of it and maintain a proper pH and, and a water system, someone who likes, you know, fish tanks or growing corals or that, that and the like, hydro, pure water, you know, would be great. You got to give the roots enough oxygen, dissolved oxygen, DO is what you like to refer to it. I mean, as long as you got enough bubbles and, and current and, and, and dissolved oxygen in that hydro system and the right pH, you're going to kill. But a lot of people don't have time to maintain a system like that. For the layman, for the regular guy, I would recommend a nice dirt mix. It has some nutrients in it, like Fox Farm, Ocean Forest. There's a lot of other ones out there, Sunshine Mix. I mean, anything, anything that's from the industry that has, has pH buffering in it, it's going to protect you from when you forgot to water that day. It's going to store some of it. You don't have to check the pH if the water coming from your tap. I don't really recommend tap water. I would say any kind of filter, carbon filter, whatever filter you can put on the water, just so you have some type of filtration from your tap, I highly recommend. I um, usually can pick it up for about 60 bucks. It hooks into like a hose type um, male part. You can find that outside or in the basement under your laundry sink usually. Um, screw it into there. That goes into your water filter. And then you could use a small garbage can or something else to collect that filtered water. And then the nutrient, you can buy nutrients. Again, most lines of nutrients that are formulated for cannabis that you can get at the grocery store, you can get online, they all work pretty well. Make sure they have pH buffering, again, to keep, keep the risk down of throwing off the pH balance for the soil, for the roots. We are, uh, we're talking to Judd, who is the head grower of the M66 group. We've got to take a break on the Todd L. Levitt Law Show. When we come back, we will get into the second part of home growing. Uh, we'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back to the Todd L. Levitt Law Show, broadcasting and podcasting in the middle of the mitten, uh, secluded and away from other individuals who are inhabiting planet Earth other than my loved ones and the four-legged creatures and the ones with fins that swim around my fish tank, Craig Russell. You didn't have to bring your dogs into the studio. Your dogs are living there, right there, because we're all in our uh, our bunkers. Uh, I'm in mine. You're, you are in yours. Our special guest, uh, Judd, who is the head grower for M66 Group, is in his bunker. We are not going to reveal where he is because we don't want to give away any of his secrets or anything. But he is going to enlighten us on some of the stuff that's going on. We're talking about home growing. And uh, we left off the last segment uh, talking about the difference between dirt and water. Uh, are, 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 we being, are you leading us on the right path here, Judd, to, to great success to do this? Or is there other things that we need to know that would make you go from being a good grower and growing a little bit to being a great grower? Well, I mean, I think everybody at home needs needs to set up a little grow in their closet or their laundry room so that they can provide themselves some cannabis during this uh, crazy time. I think everybody needs some to alleviate some of the, the cabin fever, the worry. Um, and I think anybody can do that with a very small budget, under 200 bucks. Find a 4 by 4 space somewhere. Set up a, a T5 fluorescent light or even a bunch of, you know, curly Q CFLs um, and then get a 600 HPS um, grow bulb. Um, order that online anywhere. Get it delivered. Plug it into the simple outlet. It's still under the 15 amps you can probably put on that circuit and get some seeds however you can get them. 
I like, you know, basic old school names, White Widow, Sour Diesel, Pineapple Express. Get some seeds that, that are actually going to be what they say, Blue Dream, and throw some of them in there. Pop a seed, you know, pop some seeds. Get them in some dirt. Get them in some hydro, you know. If you want to get some pumps and, and get your hydro going, do that. And put in, those two lights, everybody in Michigan can take their 12 plants and have some great smoke in a couple months when this is all over. Um, but yeah, if we want to go back to, to, to what separates the, the men from the boys, yeah, you got to get genetics that cost $25,000 a cutting. You got to get that stuff. Somebody spent four years isolating the perfect version of this, this strain. Um, you got to get that new, new, and then you got to give the plant the absolute perfect environment. You got to give them every, every opportunity possible. You can't give them a tiny bit of stress. You need to have constant water supply. They need to love their light fresh bulbs every three months or, you know, every year if you're doing the double-ended. You know, I like to see, I like to see places going into liquid cooling, um, you know, like you're in a freezer, basically. Obviously, they're not putting it at those temperatures. They're leaving the general forced air, heating, cooling. Um, obviously, the CO2 levels have got to be perfect. What you know, about... Right, it costs a lot of money. Basic facility is, you know, $2 million to get going. I mean, so what, what this, you, meant- you know, well, what this what this sounds like is much like any kind of a hobby, you know, if like Todd who likes to mountain bike. Todd, you've got yourself uh, a really expensive bike, tires, you've got the gear and everything, but somebody could easily go to Walmart buy a hundred dollar uh, bike and still get to do the same kind of thing. It sounds like this is the same kind of deal. Uh, wonder- not exactly, but well, okay. I'll, I'll give- that's okay. Uh, I'm not a snobbish biker. I'm just yeah. saying if you're going to do something right, as Judd is saying, you want to have the right sure. things. In- if, if, if you're going to bike at a high level and you're going to grow at a high level, as Judd said, you have to spend the money. And same thing with biking. I mean, you get what you pay for. True. But but what I'm saying is, is and what, what I think you're saying, Judd, is, is that no matter, no matter what your level of what money you have, you can still do this. It just might not be as successful as if you've got fifty thousand dollars to spend on it. Much the same way any other hobby, you might be, a, you might still be able to have the same kind of enjoyment of it for two hundred dollars as you do for fifty thousand. But you could definitely tell the difference between fifty thousand and two hundred. <laughs> so, Judd, yeah, what happens once the 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 plant? So now, you know, you're you're paying close attention. Your the water. <clears throat> Or the soil, the the air quality, the lighting, you know everything, moisture, everything you were referring to earlier, pH uh, testers, the LED lighting. Um, so now take us through the process, and as the monster grows, uh, what are you doing next with that monster? Well, I just wanted to add a little bit to Craig's point there. It, there is in no place space where the grower's love and attention can actually make something great out of a small budget. And call it a green thumb or or love or whatever, but but someone at home can make something special that they're really going to enjoy, you know, on on a shoestring budget. Just want to put that. What out makes there. one grower better than the uh, the next? Like product wise, you hear people, you know, going to legal dispensaries or medical provisioning centers, AA dispensaries, or people who are growing who have a legal right to grow at home. What makes a product? I mean, there's different strains. If you want to talk about that, there's sativa, indica. You were talking about male plants, female plants. So can yeah. what what makes you better than anybody else when you're growing? Well, I mean, the first thing is you have to start with the best genetics. Um, what makes someone better is 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 the stuff they're working with. You're only as good as the genetics let you be. And the reality of that is is that. I um, mean, whoever's holding the best thing is holding the best thing. Beneath that, I mean, it's all about control, control and skill and knowledge and balance. And, you know, you could grow, like you said, the hydro systems or dirt. Um, you know, within hydro, there's hundreds of types of media. I mean, I could name five right now. Rockwell, cocoa, um, clay pellets, pea moth. So each one has its own balance of how much water you should be watering that particular plant of that size and that strain. And, and a great grower takes those genetics and he, and he, he makes the balance work. And to make the balance work on a large scale is hard. And that's what separates the good from the great. Judd, when you hear, you know, people in all facets of life, from law enforcement to courts to growers, you know, who you talk about percentages, you know, the, how, the best percentage, THC percentage in that plant, in that, in that bud, how do you get the best percentage of the highest THC content? And again, we're only having a conversation. We're not asking anybody to do anything they do not have a legal right to do. So we got to qualify that. So how do you get the best? Of the best 
well, back to the genetics? I mean, the best of the best, you have to start with the best genetics, and you have to give them a stress-free environment where the plant has everything they could want and need, all the perfect amounts of nutrients at the right times, um, the right humidity, the right temperature, the right amount of light, and, you know, the grower's got to use their eye to see how far away to put the plant from the light. On one hand, the closer to the light, the more energy the plant can absorb. On the other hand, it can get too hot or it can stress it out. Plants can get sunburn. I've seen it happen. I mean, light burn. They could get wind burn. If the, pl- if the, if the fan is blowing right on them too intensely, you can, the plant will suffer from that. So a grower has got to have the right materials. you got to have the right genetics. And they have to have the eye to make sure the plant's happy. I mean, I find when my plants are happy, they're looking up at the light, like smiling almost. The leaves are like perky. And they're facing the light, and they're they're just happy. You can just feel the happiness. So, I mean, again, a human would be happy in the temperature of the plant, in the temperature and the environment a plant wants to be happy. If you need to wear your sweatshirt in the grow room or need to be in your underwear, it's too hot or too cold. Um, yeah, I mean, feel the plant. Be one. So, what happens when a plant's grown? What do you do? How do you? What happens? So my first answer is you flush. It's very important to get out all of the nutrient salts that you took up in your nutrients. Um, if you have a five gallon pot, I would give about three times as much of that in fresh water. So 15 gallons of water, run it through, you know, maybe do this outside or somewhere where it's easy to drain in a bathtub or near a floor drain in the basement would be ideal. Um, and just keep running it through, I, you know, then you can put your plant back where it was at. I would leave it there, you know, let, let the flush settle in, settle in. I wouldn't cut it down right away, right after flushing it, at least 24 hours. Um, you could also do it in an easier way where you just give the plant more water than usual um, for about a week. Um, that would be three, three or four waterings. Um, that'll accomplish it too. Um, I like the, the final flush method where you get everything out. Um, again. That'll, that'll equal a lot cleaner smoke. It usually burns differently. They say a joint <clears throat> that the ashes turn white is a cleaner flushed bud than if the ashes stay black when you're smoking a joint is the way some people tell. Also, the nutrient salts can crackle. Um, that could also be a sign of having spider mites in the weed, too, if it crackles when you smoke it. Um, Either way, so do a good flush, and then you can start your cut down. And now you're going to spend two to two and a half months, if it's the usual strain, um, in your flowering state. Um, And now the plant is going to make a flower. It's going to change from being leaves and branches to having the white little hairs come off it. And it's going to turn into a golf ball size, you know, with a lot of white hairs. We have to call them golf balls at that point. That's about, you know, two, two, three weeks in. Um, Then you're going to start seeing a little bit of orange hairs. The buds are going to beef up, assuming you have good genetics or even decent genetics. I'm going to start to see crystals on them. And then about, you know, two months, you're going to see the, the, the hairs will start turning darker. You're going to have a majority of, of orange hairs. I mean, you can't see any more white hairs or can't see very many more white hairs. And the plant's still looking green and nice. Again, that varies on the strain. Some plants, you know, might turn a little yellow or purple at that point. Um, you got to feel them out. At that point, I always need to have some type of microscope to look at the, the trichromes, the crystals. So you're going to look at them up close, as close as you can. You want to see that they actually have the full structure, which is a stem and a head on it, almost like a mushroom top. Um, that shows you that there is THC in there, that the trichrome is fully developed. Um, from there, the color um, will indicate when is harvest time. If they're all still clear white, I mean, so clear clear that you can see right through them and there isn't any haziness or whiteness to them that would show that it's underdeveloped that it needs a little more time on the tree before you cut it um, when you start seeing a little bit of amber inside or white or haziness the amber would be the final step um, some people like to le- like to let that amber come on it gives a little more of a couch effect a stronger effect um, some people like to cut it you know when it's clearer because they want more of a sativa or clear high or creative high um, you know, that varies very much by strain more than this particular harvest. But I tend to think that you can make a sativa smoke like an indica if you harvest it very late um, or vice versa. Just like a fine wine, if you harvest it, you know, late, it's going to be sweeter. Um, anyway, so you can choose the harvest based on how you like it. But I would definitely recommend having an eye on those trichromes, see them change from clear to, to white uh, to hazy to then amber and cut it when you like it. 
Um, they say when amber, you know, I say when you start seeing some amber, it's ready to come down. Also, I judge on the greenness. So, you know, so take us through that process. What what end. happens? So you said when it's ready to so come you've down. Done it, judge, you've so done it. You've spent, let's say, take a it down. from seed. You spent your four to five month process. You've done everything right. You've kept the right temperature. And now it's time to cut them down. A lot of people mess up at this stage after doing everything else perfectly. I myself am guilty of that. Um, so you want to dry it. I'll tell you the most ideal scenario for the connoisseur, and then I'll tell you realistically. Um, the most ideal scenario is called 60-60-60, which is 60% relative humidity, 60 degrees, and 60 days. Um, that will make some really yummy stuff. I mean, that would take up a lot of real estate, too. I mean, whatever closet that is, you have to maintain all those, you know, those numbers, those measurements for that long. Um, so realistically, you know, we'll throw them up for a couple weeks around 40, 45, 50% relative humidity. You want to have some airflow in the room, you know, using dehumidifiers to maintain the humidity. Um, you know, you don't want light. THC degrades by two ways, heat and light. If you can keep those two things away, like Tom Petty says, store it in a cool, dry place. Traveling uh, Wilburys, no? The gra great Tom Petty Traveling Wilburys reference there. I don't yeah, know if that's, that's ever been great. referenced on this show. <laughs> Uh, hey, we got to take a break, guys. Judd, uh, can you stick around for a little more for the uh, last segment of the show? I'll do anything for Todd, man. All right, there we go. We'll be right back on the Todd Elevator Thanks, Judd. Appreciate that. <laughs> To the Todd L. Levitt Law Show, joined by my good friend Judd. We're just calling him Judd. What up? Head grower, M66 Group. What up, Judd? Happy to be here, Todd. Take us through. We, if you're just tuning in, we've been talking about everything and anything that has to do with uh, you know planting, growing, you name it. And uh, where are we at now, Judd? We're at the finish yes. line here. You've cut it down. Now we got to put it, we got to hang it. I love to hang it upside down. Do not trim it wet. If you trim it wet, the buds themselves and the leaves will leak green chlorophyll all over your buds and you will taste it when you smoke it. It is easier to trim it wet because the leaves are all perky and you can chop it easily with the scissors because they're perking up for you. But it is not worth it. Do not do it. You can cut off the big leaves. You know, a lot of people like to juice those and make kind of like a CBD juice kind of thing for workout buffs. That's kind of cool. Um, as long as you didn't get them all dirty when you cut them um so yeah i would i would i would take the big leaves off don't cut the buds don't cut the little leaves coming out of the bud so what i would like to do is i'd like you to, to get a little dehumidifier and in, in a garage or a closet and set it to 50 degrees 50 percent rh and kind of turn it on hang the plant upside down from a you know clothes hanger or a hook or something like that and uh and let it rip Leave her there for about a week, and you should be good to smoke at that point. Well, you've you got the plant upside down. It's drying, but what happens after the dry stage? So now you've got a dried plant. You took off the big leaves once you cut it down. Um, so what you need to do is call the short trim. You would take a pair of scissors, ideally ones that have some springs so it's easier for you, and you would want to trim the leaves off the buds just to kind of shape it up and form it. Um, take the leaves that kind of curled over the pretty buds off. You can use those for cooking or making hash with. 
Um, into a nug? How about into a into nug? Into your nug, sure, yeah. And then you got your nugs, and that's it. That's the whole process. It's a lot easier than you'd think. You hear people, we've talked about it on the show for years, sativa versus indica, um, hybrids. Uh, for the late person out there, how, how do you get one versus the other, and how do you get a combo? Back to genetics, obviously, and the grow process, but can you talk about that briefly? Yeah, so native native sativas and native indicas come from different parts of the world. Um, it's rumored that the indica, um, well, not rumored, the indi- it's rumored that the entire cannabis plant comes from India. Um, they have the, the oldest dated cannabis, cannabis paraphernalia references, from what I understand. I think China also, actually. But India is the place that I know is supposedly called the foundations of the cannabis plant. So indica comes from India, um, and that is a short plant that has broad leaves. It likes a lot of sun and heat, obviously. Um, and that's going to be your, your sleepy time, bud. Um, that's known as a knockout, a sedative, a pain relief um, in general. Uh, sativas are usually taller plants. There's more of a spacing in between each branch or in, or node. The node is where the new branch comes off of the main stem. Um, so the sativa plant is known for more of a creative high, a hallucinogenic style. Paranoia could be a side effect of a really good racy sativa. Um, sativas are known to come from Thailand or Mexico. Uh, also, uh, South Africa has a very famous sativa called Durban Poison. Happen to love it if you see it anywhere. It's a definite winner to grow as well. Um, so it just depends on where you get it from, uh, where it's actually from, um, and that's going to have a major effect on what it does. Like I mentioned earlier, you know, depending on when you harvest it, you give it a sativa or an indica effect. Uh, the later you harvest it and it's in its prime or if it's overripe, it would be more of an indica, even if it was a sativa. And then you have, like you said, the hybrids where people bred a sativa and an indica together. Um, and then you bred a hybrid together with another hybrid. So there's so many variations. I mean, it, it's endless and um, it's it's a beautiful world out there, a lot to explore, a lot to grow. That's some great information, Judge. It's great information. And you've agreed to come back on the show throughout the year to provide listeners with more information and updates. And you'll be at the 420 Canna Hemp Expo taking place now on July 11th. So it'll be good to see you out there. And throughout the weeks and months to sure, come, we'll anybody. talk more about uh, M66 Group and all the great things the group is doing uh, at this time. But, uh, Judd, do you have any uh, recommendations as far as you mentioned a number of strains throughout the show? Uh, what are some of your favorites? Mm, I like I like a company out of Michigan. I like two companies out of Michigan that are great. Um, called one is uh, Midnight Roots, and another is TGA Subcool. Um, R.I.P. He's a great guy. He's in, influenced the cannabis industry just in so many ways. Subcool. Um, I love his Plush Berry. I love his Ace of Spades. I love his Jack the Ripper. I mean, old school classic stuff. And he's out of the UP. Um, at least he, he was. I think his, his uh, somebody took over his, his, his gig over there. Just, uh, you know, local Michigan. Keep it Michigan, baby. We got the best tree. <laughs> Fantastic. Agent 18. And again, we're only talking about doing things that you have a legal right to do. I am a defense attorney. and uh, But, Judd, it's been great having you on the show. And we Thanks wish, a lot, we wish. Thanks for everything you've done for the cannabis industry here and, and internationally. And we really appreciate you on this world. And, Entertainment and Craig and, and, and Craig information no. and Craig Russell. No, no, I don't. Craig know Russell's at all. the king. I'm nothing without Craig. Oh no, no. All I got to tell you is, Todd, the show's over. We got to get going. Come on, Craig. What are you talking about? Come We're just on. getting started here. Come I didn't get a complaint on. in. No, it's been a jam. All this show. other stuff. Jam- this is what the coronavirus does. It jam packs the show. We got to get. You going. know, you you did ask me during the break, Craig, if our office was still open as a business, and yeah, our law firm is still up and oh, running because with these license cases, driver's license restoration, it takes three to four months to complete all the paperwork. So. Yeah, we're still cranking it and spanking it and getting all the paperwork gathered for our clients. And uh, the assessors are doing everything via phone. Uh, there's still one or two clinics still open, believe it or not. So, yeah, we're still – Levitt Law Firm is still operational. But, Craig, Judd, great show. Craig, do we really have to go? We really do have to go. I'm not just a litigator. I'm an advocator, and we're not here for a long time. We're here for a good time. Take us out, Craig Russell. We'll see you. The 
Todd L. Levitt Law Show, brought to you by Chad Malley Well Drilling of Rosebush, Clark Modular Homes, your most experienced and trusted builder in Mount Pleasant, and attorney Todd L. Levitt, not just a litigator, he's an advocator. Opinions expressed on this radio program do not necessarily reflect the views of this radio station.